uh, investor conference call of Deutsche Telekom, as always, with our CEO, Tim Hutkes, and our CFO, Thomas Dannenfeld. Um, as always, also uh, the remark, you'll find the disclaimer in our presentation very important because the alternative would be me reading that out, which would take about another 10 minutes. Uh, and that, uh, without any further ado, let's go right into the, uh, the investor presentation and start with Tim Hutkes. Tim? Yeah, welcome, everybody. Um, you see that uh, Stefan is pushing on the time, so I will do my best, you know, um, to guide you through the um, quarter result um, um, 2014. Um, let's start today's call with a brief summary um, of what we have achieved strategically, operationally, and fin financially in this quarter. Um, I think we made good progress in the implementation of our strategy during this quarter. Um, to give us a few examples. First, um, in our all IP migration program, we finished as forecasted the migration in our first European country, Macedonia, and migrated um, almost 500,000 customers to all IP in Germany. By the way, a run rate of almost 50,000 um, customers a week. Both our LTE and fiber rollout, particularly in Germany, are full steam underway. In the Czech Republic, we bought out the minority shareholders, thereby paving the way for the integration of the GTS fixed assets after the closing of the deal, which during the quarter was approved, by the way, without any remedies. And the T-Systems 2015 restructuring program started um, in that quarter with the sale of IDS and a significant reduction of our hardware wholesale activities, as well as first cancellation of unprofitable contracts. There was even, you know, an agreement reached with the unions on how um, uh, we structure uh, the restructuring. Operationally, as well as financially, we can be satisfied with the first quarter and are on a good path to execute on our full year targets. I think we delivered an, an organic revenue growth of 4.2% for the group, um, something pretty unique in the European telco sector and above consensus expectation. And by the way, reading um, the, um, the results from a lot of European competitors already today, um, this, is, um, uh, this is quite unique what we uh, are showing. Q1 adjusted EBITDA was roughly in line with consensus expectations uh, and driven primarily by the record customer growth in the U.S. On the free cash flow level, we delivered $1 billion in the quarter, well ahead of consensus expectations and on good track for our full year 14 target of around $4.2 billion. And please consider, uh, you might have seen that uh, we have significantly higher capex already spent during the first quarter. As a result of that, we fully confirm our full year 2014 group guidance. Let me quickly summarize our first quarter headline financials. Revenues for the group grew by 8% year over year on a reported and 4.5% year on year on an organic basis, with the main growth drivers being the US business. The adjusted EBITDA decline of 3.9% was mainly driven by the exceptionally strong US subscriber growth and a somewhat weaker to systems contribution in the quarter. The adjusted net income in the quarter was mainly a result of the EBITDA development, whereas the reported net income was supported by the financial gain from the sale of the Scout stake. The free cash flow, as said, was nearly stable year over year at $1 billion, driven by a roughly stable year-on-year -year cash capex and a slightly lower operational free cash flow, compensated by a slightly higher dividend from our UK business EE. And, as flagged, our net debt clearly was reduced to around 38 um, billion euros, driven by the free cash flow and the proceeds of sale of the 70% stake in Scout, which were somewhat compensated by the minority buyout in the Czech Republic and some other effects. The net debt, however, will clearly be higher in the second quarter as a result of the annual dividend payment, as well as the cash out for the A block acquired from Verizon, which is expected in the second quarter. With this, I hand over to Thomas for the operational details 
of the quarter. Thanks, Tim. Um, let's move now to the operational financial details of the quarter and uh, let's, like always, start with Germany. Um, we are pleased with our performance in the Germany in the quarter. German revenues declined by 1.5% year on year, a slight improvement versus the fourth quarter. Main driver this quarter were the mobile service revenues, which again showed a continuous improvement and returned to a slight 0.2 percentage point positive growth with almost no MTR impact in the quarter. Core fixed line revenues declined by 3% in line with the trend in the previous quarters. And I'll come back to this uh, for a deep dive perspective in a second. Our wholesale revenues continued to show a positive trend improvement declining by one percentage point year on year driven by our contingent model. The adjusted EBITDA declined by 1.1% year on year resulting in a strong and year on year improved EBITDA margin of 40.7%. The adjusted OPEX in Germany decreased by 1% year on year driven by a lower revenue related costs like interconnection and a slightly lower market in West which was somewhat counterbalanced by costs related to our IP transformation and our integrated network rollout. In the German fixed, we saw all in all another satisfying quarter in line with the previous quarters. I would like to highlight the following. A 21% year-on-year reduction in line losses to 214K despite 70,000 DTLTE wireless broadband customers added into the, in the quarter. An accelerated growth of new fiber customers with 222,000 net new additions, of which 129,000 came from our own retail business, the strongest quarter since we started marketing of the product. In total, we already have 1.74 million fiber customers on our German network now. Broadband net ads continue to improve to minus 7,000 in the quarter, though we are not yet where we want to be. On the TV side, our measures to increase the momentum and entertain showed again results in Q1, with 78,000 new customers being added. Importantly, more than 60,000 of these new entertain customers booked the entertain package with the fiber access. As promised, let me do a little bit of a deep dive into our revenues on the fixed line side. The overall fixed network revenues, core fixed line and holds in Q1 declined by 2.5%, with the fixed revenues, fixed line, as per backup definition, declined by 3%. Within these fixed revenues, we saw a further slight improvement in voice revenues, as in previous quarters, with revenues being down by 7.4% in the first quarter. However, we are not satisfied with the development of our connected home revenues, which declined by 1.2% in the quarter. This is not in line with what we set as target of 2% growth. Within the connected home revenues, we saw a continued decline of our broadband revenues with minus 3% and a further slowing momentum of our TV revenues with a growth of 7.7%. This means that we will have to work hard with our integrated network rollout and our upselling efforts in order to turn this around. In the other fixed network revenues, we saw the following major trends. The decline of 11.1% year on year and our var variable revenues was in line with the trend of the previous quarters and is mainly driven by price as well as volume decreases attributable to flat rate components. Fixed line add-on options decreased by minus 7% year on year, showing a downward trend since quarters due to the increase of bundle revenues. And our increase in other revenues fixed by plus 4.7% year on year is mainly driven by sale of terminal equipment in the leasing model. In our wireline wholesale revenues, we see a continuous improvement since quarters driven by the strong uptake of the contingent model. Let's now turn to mobile. The German mobile market service revenues decreased by two percentage points years in year in Q1, according to our estimates, a clear improvement versus previous quarters. As anticipated, we saw a sequential improvement in our mo mobile service revenues in the first quarter and returned to a slight positive growth of 0.2 percentage points year on year, thereby again outperforming the market. Main drivers here were a continued negative but sequentially improved versus Q3 and Q4 worth revenue trend, a further slightly accelerated revenue decline in SMS revenues of minus 35 percent, and again a very strong mobile data growth of 28.8 percent. 
Operational, we continued our strong performance in the quarter. We had 551,000 mobile contract net ads, of which 204,000 were own branded net ads. We showed a continued strong smartphone momentum with 953,000 sales, including strong sales of Android and iOS devices. At the end of the first quarter, we already had 3.5 million LTE customers on our network in Germany. And we continued to have the best class contract churn at 1.1%. Let me also give you an update on our progress in terms of strategy execution regarding our integrated network rollout and our IP transformation in Germany on the following slide. By the end of the first quarter, we are at 35%, uh, 38% sorry, fiber and a 74% LTE POP coverage. We have already migrated 2.6 million customers to all IP in Germany, which translates into over 21% of all of our broadbands and almost 13% of all our fixed lines being migrated to all IP already. Currently, we're migrating at a speed of roughly 45 to 50,000 customers per week in Germany. <clears throat> Sorry. Let me simply summarize the highlights of the quarter as all relevant numbers were already reported and discussed by our TMS colleagues for the US business last week. In Q1, the US business showed their best customer growth ever with 2.4 million new net, uh, new net customers in total, of which 1.32 million were branded postpad net ads, leading to an upward revision of the full year branded postpad net ads target to 2.8 to 3.3 million. At the same time, we saw a strong year-on-year -year reduction of 40 basis points in our branded postpaid churn down to 1.5% and a continued improvement in our customer quality. 53% of our equipment installment plan receivables are regarded as prime, up from 44% in Q1 2013. Service bad debt expenses decreased 3% year-on-year and 13% quarter-on-quarter in Q1 2014. Most importantly, TMUS returned to a 4.5% service revenue growth in a quarter on a pro forma combined basis. Postpaid service revenues grew even at 5.6%. As a result of the stellar subscriber growth in the quarter, the pro forma combined adjusted EBITDA decreased by 25.9% year in year. And also as a result of the higher than expected subscriber growth for the year, T-Mobile US revised their full year EBITDA guidance slightly down to 5.6 to 5.8 billion US dollar under US gap for the full year. Now let's turn to Europe. Revenues in our European segment declined 6.5% year on year on a reported basis and 2.6% organically in the quarter, driven by the following effects. Broadly stable operational trends in our traditional telco revenues quarter and quarter but weaker ICT, energy, and handset wholesale trends compared to the fourth quarter. It is worth mentioning that from 83 million organic revenue decline in this quarter, 61 million are coming from the mobile regulation. On a reported basis, the adjusted EBITDA on the segment declined by 6.4% and organically by 2.3%, resulting in a slightly year-on-year -year improved EBITDA margin of 32.9% for the segments. Main drivers were here, lower direct costs driven by, among others, lower market invest as the share of split contract transaction in some of the countries was higher, and also good indirect cost savings in some markets, particularly in uh, Greece, resulting from last year's headcount reduction program, offsetting higher share of lower margin revenue businesses. We continued to show good momentum in some of our growth areas in Europe. We showed satisfying growth in TV with 55 thousand net ads now reaching almost 3.6 million TV customers in Europe. Importantly, we, are also uh, we also increased the number of our triple play customers in the region to 1.7 million, up from 1.4 million a year ago. We delivered 58,000 broadband net ads in the quarter, and on mobile contract, however, we were not satisfying at 12,000 uh, new ads. Here we were clearly lost momentum in the countries like Poland, the Netherlands, and Romania. Mobile data organic revenue growth remains strong at 17%, thereby continuing to compensate the decline in the SMS revenues. Let me give you a quick update on the progress being made on the revenue as well as on the technology and cost transformation in the segment Europe in the quarter. The share of total revenues 
from our growth areas increased by three percentage points year on year from 25%. The share of the fixed revenues from connected home grew by two percentage points year on year to 23%, driven by TV revenue growth, especially in Croatia, Greece, and due to our acquisition of Digi in Slovakia. The share of mobile data revenues of overall mobile revenues grew by three percentage points to 19%. We are especially pleased here with the uh, growth rates in the Netherlands, the Czech Republic, and also in Croatia. And the share of B2B ICT revenues as of total revenues increased by 0.9 percentage points to 3.8%, driven mainly by our Slovakian and Romanian operations. We also continue to make good progress with our partnering efforts. For example, our partnership with the Evernote now is launched in all 12 countries, the one with Deezer on the music downloads in six and Spotify in another two. The IP share of all fixed networks access lines grew by 10 percentage points to 29%, mainly driven by Slovakia, Croatia, Hungary, and Romania. LTE sites in service almost increased by six times year on year to 6.7 thousand. We have LTE networks in commercial use now in 10 out of 12 countries already. Homes connected with fiber to the home grew by 43% year on year to around 200K, and households passed with VDSL slash FTTH technology increased to over 5 million. Let's now turn over to, to systems. Um, the first quarter clearly already was impacted by the restructuring um, at the market unit. The reported revenues decrease of 7.8% uh, was driven by Tel-IT, but also by uh, the market unit. Tel-IT revenues declined by 12.7% year-on-year, reflecting a lower demand slash cost base. The market unit reported a revenue decline of 6.7% year-on-year. Adjusting for deconsolidation and FX, the organic revenue declined by 4.1%. This was clearly impacted by the first steps towards the 2015 plus restructuring plan. And for example, a significant first reduction in hardware reselling and first cancellation of an unprofitable customer contract. And the decline is in line with the projected revenue decline for the full year 2014 as a result of the restructuring and the announced repositioning of T systems. T systems adjusted EBITDA and EBIT declined significantly in the quarter as a result of revenue decline and seasonal cost deviation, which is suspected to reverse in the upcoming quarters. Let's move now to our group financials for the quarter, turning to free cash flow first. Group free cash flow is down 5.3% in Q1 at almost 1 billion euro, significantly ahead of market expectation and on track for our full year guidance of around 4.2 uh, billion. Main drivers were a roughly stable year-on-year -year operational cash flow, and a roughly stable year-on-year -year cash capex. Group net debt was reduced as anticipated by over a billion to th uh, 38 billion at the end of the first quarter, with the biggest moving parts being the 1.6 billion cash contribution from the sale of the 70% scout stake, the 0.8 billion payout of the buyout of the minorities in the Czech Republic, and clearly the 1 billion free cash flow. The adjusted net income decreased by 23.5% year on year in the quarter, driven by A, the decline in adjusted EBITDA, B, the increase in DNA, driven by the US, and here predominantly due to the uh, Metro PCS consolidation, and C, a decrease in PL taxes in the quarter in line with the decline of the adjusted EBITDA. The group Rosie benefited strongly from the book gain on the sale of Scout uh, Stake and stood at 9.3 at the end of the first quarter. Please bear in mind that mathematically throughout the year, the impact of that scout book gain will be diluted. So that the 9% first quarter rose is definitely not an indication for the full year of 2014. Turning to our balance sheet ratios, net debt to adjusted EBITDA remains stable versus year end 2014 at 2.2 times as a result of the se se sequential reduction of the net debt. The equity ratio increased slightly to 27.9% uh, due to the slightly higher asset base and the increased shareholder equity. With regard to our comfort zone ratios, we are in green with regard to all ratios. And our ratings remain stable at triple B plus level with major agencies and stable outlooks. As a result, we continue to get excellent funding conditions in the debt cattle markets. 
Let me now hand over to Tim again for a quick summary on our priorities for the full year 2014. Yeah, thanks, Thomas. Um, so on the strategic side, um, I think we have to execute upon our strategy, and um, which we have updated you upon. Um, and um, um, it is along the line of the four principles. First, integrated IP networks. Second, best customer experience. Thirdly, win with partners. And fourth, we uh, lead in business. Um, we have a lot of things on the plate, uh, and we are very, very active on, on pushing things forward. And I want to give you a little bit on insights on the priorities uh, uh, we are working on. I think in Germany, we have to execute on our all IP migration with the target of migrating around 3 million customers this year. Um, and keep in mind, we have to um, tap every single customer uh, uh, in a dialogue and even, you know, physically uh, on, his, on his infrastructure at home. Secondly, we have to drive our integrated network rollout at full speed. Thirdly, we are driving integrated products. So the fixed mobile converged products are coming um, during the course of this year. Fourthly, improving our performance in the broadband market um, from a net uh, ads perspective. And um, last but not least, we have to execute on our um, new um, uh, small and medium enterprise initiative, uh, which we have laid out uh, uh, in our last meeting. In the US, we want to execute upon our LTE rollout, target of 250 million pop coverage now. This gives us new market opportunities um, as well for Metro PCS, but as well even for the T-Mobile brand. We have to deliver upon our new higher branded postpaid net ad target, which we have laid out in the quarter result of 2.8 to 3.3 million new customers. And we want to deliver upon the EBITDA target of 5.6 um, billion US dollar under US GAAP. In our European priorities, um, if the, um, the priorities are as follows. First, we have to drive our IP migration with full speed uh, within Slovakia being completed by year end. We have to continue to grow in our defined growth areas, mobile broadband, TV, and B2B ICT business. And we are going to start the integration of our GTS business um, uh, we have recently acquired. And last but not least, we have to design our pan-European network concept, um, which is a very innovative and new um, uh, instrument in our industry. At the systems, I think the path is clearly defined. We have to implement the restructuring program, which we call the systems 2015. We have to increase our EBITDA and EBIT run rate throughout the year, by the way, improving in the second half of the year, and continue to deliver upon our spend reduction target of one billion um, until 2015 um, at Telecom IT, uh, where we had made great progress uh, over the last three uh, quarters. With this, Thomas and I are happy to answer your questions. Well, thank you very much, Tim. We start now with the Q&A part, and I think we can finish uh, upon time at uh, 3 p.m. CET. As always, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your touchtone telephone. The operator will announce your name when it's uh, your turn to ask a question. Should you require to cancel your question, please press the pound sign. Just a very quick remark. The U.S. guidance, obviously, as given by the U.S. colleagues, is 5.6 to $5.8 billion under U.S. gap. And now we start with the first one. I think the first one is Fred Boulan from Nomura. Hey, good afternoon, uh, gentlemen. Thanks for uh, taking the question. Um, firstly, um, a question on uh, your assets in Europe. Uh, Tim, I think you mentioned this morning um, unsatisfactory progress in, in a couple of assets, Poland, Holland. Um, can you discuss your options here? Uh, and, and also about EE, how do you think about uh, this asset, um, considering the absence of fixed uh, there and the entry of BT uh, in the consumer market later in the year? Uh, and secondly, um, on the U.S. consolidation, uh, John uh, Leger was on the tape last week uh, saying consolidation was a matter of when uh, and not if. So, um, you know, would you be, you know, if you see meaningful synergies in a combination with another asset, would you be ready to share 
uh, the antitrust risk by not requiring a significant breakup fee. Um, and also, if you can uh, walk us through your thoughts on uh, monetization, monetization of your stake uh, going into the lockup expiry at the end of this year versus other options, and in particular, how you think about the AWS S3 auctions uh, in that context. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fred. Um, so um, let me start with the assets in Europe. Um, look, um, our, I think Thomas and my uh, um, uh, ambition is always to be very clear and not always making uh, a dog and pony show uh, on quarter results, but even vocal about, let's say, challenges which we are facing. Um, that was the reason that we were um, um, addressing this uh, issue on the Netherlands and as well on Poland. Um, by the way, um, I think um, the the net ad numbers uh, um, uh, on the mobile side uh, weren't um, uh, um, as high as we uh, expected. Um, we want to see um, uh, uh, more share on the marketplace, um, especially in, in, the, in Poland against the uh, orange. We were facing quad play uh, offers um, uh, in that market. Um, um, we even had um, uh, a little bit less um, uh, um, momentum uh, on pets and on other things because we took some promotions out of the business um, uh, to improve the, uh, the, the profitability. And in the Netherlands, um, I think um, we have um, changed um, a little bit the, the, the logic of the split contract support here. So, um, so with this... Um, um, I think um, the the market the market um, uh, ambitious should be a little bit higher for our teams um, in this uh, in these regions. Um, uh, that has nothing to do that we are now um, question the portfolio position um, of these two assets. It's an operational uh, topic um, which we're going to address throughout the year. With regard to the U.S. consolidation, uh, when uh, not uh, if um, and, and ready to share. Um, uh, the, the risks and how could we monetize um, um, our stake here um, um, with the expiry of the lockup um, and um, what are our thoughts on the upcoming spectrum auctions? That is how I understood your question, Fred. I think the first thing is we are very happy how our U.S. business is developing. Um, we said last time, first what you have to do to turn around the business is infrastructure. We built this infrastructure of 200 million pops, which we now increase to 250. With the LTE proposition, we said we have something to sell in the marketplace. Now um, we gained over the last four quarters big-time customers. Now the big-time customers, as a third step, is creating revenues. And um, for the first time this quarter, we are able um, to show you um, the increase on an organic level um, that we have increased 4.5 now. Now the logical consequence is that now free cash flow and EBITDA is the consequence out of this customer growth, which will help us to self-fund um, further growth um, uh, in the U.S. business. So that this is becoming a self-funding platform which is creating uh, uh, more momentum uh, in the marketplace. Um, so far, uh, we are very proud of what we're doing, especially if you look to the design of, of some of the EO shops or if you look to the branding of Sprint, you know, they are copy-pacing uh, what we're doing and trying to do that. So um, I think the momentum of our, of our proposition is unbroken, um, and therefore whatever we do, we do it for creating additional value in the U.S. market. There is no pressure, there is no hurry for selling a business um, at that point in time. Um, uh, we have a self-funding platform um, which, is, which is nicely developing. That said, um, correct, um, we will have an expiry of the lockup by the end of the year um, um, so that we are open to sell um, some of the stock here. Um, and right, there's even a lot of speculation with regard to, uh, uh, to Sprint. I don't want to put oil into the fire uh, on that one in this uh, conference call, um, but uh, I reiterate what I've said always. Um, you know, we are open. Uh, to create the super maverick. Um, I think, you know, to really create value in the market at a higher speed with a better network, with even more spectrum, a combination, for instance, with one of the players would make a lot of sense to create a super maverick against AT&T, against this bifurcated market in the U.S. So therefore, if there would be an opportunity, um, it would be possible. But you even know that the FCC and the DOJ made their statements um, they want to keep this um, environment open um, uh, for four players. Um, I could always say, you know, look, you could say, if you want that, what are, let's say, then the prerequisites 
um, from a spectrum policy, um, uh, from reserved spectrum, and from advantages to compete with this, uh, with these two big players. This is something uh, which we're going to see next week because the FCC. Um, um, is said to propose uh, pro-competitive spectrum auction rules for the next uh, year's 600 megahertz incentive auctions. Um, I even have um, uh, heard um, that there might be a spectrum reservation for smaller carriers. Let's see what we, um, what we will hear at the 15th of May um, on, on um, that um, subject. Um, so, therefore, it is, it is too early to say something um, on uh, how, it is, how it is developing, but we have a, um, a very good momentum at that point in time. Um, with regard to the spectrum auction, we are waiting for the, uh, for the design which is coming, um, and um, we plan to participate um, in the auction next year. Tim, I'm going okay, to thank, you. thank you very much. EE on the, the, the third question, I think, was on EE and the perspective on uh, BT entering the market here on the mobile side. I think, uh, first of all, what, what Tim mentioned uh, on the US is, is true for the EE as well. It's about value creation. And you, you know, all last year we came to the conclusion it's better to stick to, with the asset, uh, stay with the asset like it is. Um, and we think we can create more value by doing that. Why is that the case? A, um, we are happy with the, with the operational development and the performance of the EE team. Uh, they're doing extremely well, I think, compared to the to the other players in the market, uh, especially in terms of differentiating with the network, which is part of our strategy as well. So that's that's what they're doing very well on service. I think they they offer uh, they started in, uh, activities and initiatives to improve here as well to differentiate even further in the marketplace. So operationally, I think they're doing good. Um, strong team, number one. Number two, we think uh, the UK market. We'll see uh, the FMC trend as well as the, all the other European markets, but our uh, assessment is that will be a little bit delayed later than we will see it or we see it in the European markets. So there's still enough time uh, to grow on, on mobile-only businesses. That's number two. Number three is um, we also, you might know or not, um, offer with EE broadband products, and they're doing well. So they're, the, they're improving here in terms of number of customers we're gaining in margin as well. And number four, um, as BT is uh, a new wholesaler in the market based on our wholesale um, um, contract, we had a deep assessment and thought uh, whether um, it is wise and, and good to uh, keep them or to take them on our networks. We think it is. It is value creating for BT and will be value creating for EE as well. So our assessment is with the good operational performance with the right steps, uh, from EE into the broadband market and with the wholesale deal on BT, we're doing the right way to create even more value. Thanks, Tim and Thomas. Uh, let's continue with Ulrich Rate from Jeffries. Ulrich. Thanks so much. Um, my first question is um, on, on Vivendo. I noticed that it's the record high, historical record high transfer of employees into Vivendo this quarter. And it, it seems to be coming from within GHS, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm just wondering what is going on there. Is this a sign of um, significant further um, cost cutting or, or how, how do we interpret how we do we interpret this, this move at this point? And then my second question is on the, uh, on the German broadband and, and fiber situation, in particular on the retail side. Um, could you just shed a bit of light on where um, these customer net customer losses actually happen? Is this in the VDSL built-out regions, or is it in the sort of non-VDSL but cable regions, or is it outside of those regions? And could you then also maybe comment a bit more on the um, strategies that, that you intend to deploy to actually stop and turn around that customer loss, as you've indicated, as, as some of your focus point for the German business in 2014. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to start with a second question on the German broadband side. Uh, first of all, the way we, we do in the rollout um, is uh, by competitive pressure and situation, so to say. So we, we analyze where the competitive pressure is high, where churn probabilities are high, and th that's where we roll out first in the areas where we don't have a fiber infrastructure so far. So that is exa exactly the way we, we tackle the rollout. Um, it is um, important uh, to understand that the churn in the areas where we don't have VDSL infrastructure is a little bit higher, but not significantly higher than in the other areas. Um, but it's exactly the way we, we, we're tackling the rollout uh, starting with a higher uh, churn probabilities. 
um, and going there. I, I like to add something, Thomas, here on that subject. First, um, um, what we see in the areas where we built um, uh, fiber, uh, we have a huge uptake from our customer base. Uh, we have a record sales, a record sales on um, on fiber, more than 220,000 uh, only in this quarter um, on uh, on our fiber proposition. So that is um, a, a great outcome. Second. What we even see is that the trend on the broadband, uh, on the retail side, is improving. Um, we had in the fourth quarter minus 47, we had in the Q4 minus 22, and we have minus 7 in, uh, on the, uh, in the first quarter. So um, we see that our activities are improving, um, and to be very um, um, uh, um, uh, detailed here, um, we have um, even new tariffs in, in, in place um, uh, uh, on the marketplace so um, that, um, that new propositions are made like um, the call and serve via LTE um, is supporting us in areas where we cannot so, um, um, sufficiently promote fiber um, and we have even uh, promotional activities going on on the broadband side um, here in Germany to, um, to be more competitiveness even on the price side. Um, I think um, it is very important that we accelerate um, or even, you know, uh, execute along the lines of our CapEx rollout because the fiber is the answer um, uh, on, on what we're doing. And we are quite confident that uh, we're going to see a, a positive development um, throughout the year. On top of that, um, the revenue stabilization, um, uh, which is helping us as well on EBITDA and free cash flow, um, is coming from um, um, fixing... Um, the wholesale business. Remember, just a few quarters ago, we had a minus seven, minus eight percent of this uh, numbers. We are now almost stable on the uh, on the wholesale side, and um, the contingent model um, is is creating um, added value for us, um, and we are not losing this um, service revenues um, to um, the cable operators. So we're keeping some of the momentum, and the contingent model um, for the wholesalers. Um, is, is, is um, a good proposition, is working nicely in helping us to utilize the infrastructure. So I think overall, um, I think uh, you're absolutely right, um, stressing um, the negative number. We are not happy with that one, um, but we have a lot of activities, um, uh, both on broadband, but as well uh, LTE substitution, um, and as well by build out um, uh, um, up and running. And Ulrich, just on what happened uh, at GHS with the, uh, with the personnel here. Uh, we have in total a reduction of 1,118 people in GHS year over year. There are a couple of inorganic effects. So, for example, we moved the procurement out of uh, Germany and out of T-Systems into GHS to bundle that in one central function. That's about 291. Then we had uh, consolidation of smaller uh, Companies like Explosion Interactive, 37 FTEs, Click and Buy Services in India, 19 FTEs. And obviously, we had a deconsolidation of Scout of uh, 1,211 FTEs. Underlying the reduction is 254 uh, uh, stuff uh, year over year, which is a reduction of 1.2%. And obviously, that's the headcount reduction in some of the steering function and shared services. Uh, shared services started with a shape headquarter a little bit later than the, than the rest of the uh, headquarter. And that is basically, as I said, 250 FTEs. And I guess some of them actually showed then up um, at Vivento. And with respect to the details in Vivento, Andreas will come back to you right after the call. And then we continue with Paul Marsh from Berenberg. Yeah, thank you. So I, I have two questions. I just noticed on the line loss um, that the consumer line loss trend uh, continued to, to be relatively weak, um, I think slightly worse in the quarter, whereas the business line loss or the business line trend actually went positive uh, in the quarter with, with uh, about 15,000 net additions. Um, I, I'm guessing that, that that business trend is seasonal in, in the first quarter. But I, I just wonder in consumer if you have a view on um, how much of that might be being driven by mobile cannibalization and uh, whether and, and when that line loss on consumer might eventually stabilize or, or, or show some kind of inflection. Um, and then on, on VDSL, uh, just a question on the margin. Um, I'm not sure if it's, if it's right to look at it in this way, but um, are you able to, to, to give us any insight onto the, the EBITDA difference for a Deutsche Telekom ADSL customer who migrates to a retail VDSL offer with Deutsche Telekom 
uh, how that compares with a customer who migrates to a wholesale VDSL offer. So is that customer who migrates to a wholesale VDSL offer materially EBITDA dilutive? Well, Paul, let me start, and I think uh, Tim will also join upon that. Now, first of all, in, in the line losses, uh, I don't think that we see too much of an uptick in mobile cannibalization. If you look at our own mobile cannibalization via our LTE product, that's exactly down sequentially. We're now at 17,000 uh, customers uh, being on there, and that has been much stronger in, in the quarters before. So I, I don't see that. Um, uh, on the contrary, we also would not see the business trend necessarily as being a seasonal impact in the first quarter. I think it has also something to do with the rollout of VDSL and FTTC uh, uh, over the quarters. Right, okay. But, but Paul, let me add one element. Where we're, where it's a kind of regular activity we're having here is once a year, in the beginning of the year, we uh, do a kind of adaptation between the business and the consumer segments, um, looking what kind of customers we have in the consumer segment, especially being business small, very small business customers. And then what we're going to do is take them and put them into the business segment. So it's, it's every first quarter a year we have that kind of activity to look into uh, the consumer segment, take the small business customers in there and shift them into the business segment. So there's in a Q1, uh, okay. there's always that kind of effect you will see also on the yep. years beforehand. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And one last answer maybe on the... Um, 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 on the um, business customer side, absolutely right. Um, um, we are growing uh, our business. Um, so um, just, you know, up from my mind, it's something in the vicinity of 4% growth in this area from a revenue perspective. Um, and the reason is uh, simply um, the proposition which we have in the market, being it um, the, um, the, the cloud services, being it the uh, security features, um, being it um, the integrated telco services which we are delivering, um, uh, integ integrated in our service proposition, um, um, we have laid 19 new products out at, um, at CBIT uh, Fair. Um, this is uh, helping us big time here on the customer side. Um, so, therefore, on the B2B side, um, we are very strong from a propositional side, um, and we do not see, let's say, a huge attack from our competitors in this area. And Paul, just for clarification, the second question was, what's the, is there any EBITDA difference, i.e. dilution, if a DSL retail customer in Germany migrates to a VDSL offer from ourselves, right? Yeah, sure. Because, I mean, obviously you lose some costs in supporting that customer, but, but you're still making a decent ARPU from the wholesale revenue, right? Okay, but then, yes, the answer is yes, but then it was about retail moving to wholesale, the question. Yeah, so, so, so if, if we're going to see a big sort of take up from the contingent model uh, continuing through the year, you know, for, for customers who might be leaving Deutsche Telekom retail and taking up a service from whether it's O2, Vodafone, United Internet, are those customers EBITDA dilutive to you in the sense, are you, are you making less EBITDA from those customers than you would if they migrated to your VDSL service? There, um, there is a maybe, maybe it's just too complicated to answer in this, in this <laughs> forum. So. No, I think we got, now we got the question. <laughs> no, first of all, we got the question, thank you. I think there are two, two um, answers to it. First of all, strategically, you know, um, our aim is to strengthen wholesale and retail versus cable. <laughs> not to fight retail versus wholesale and let the cable guys go. So the way we think, think that is we need to be stronger than cable and stronger than the wholesale guys in the marketplace, but also make sure that wholesale can um, get a, a decent share uh, out of the market and not only cable see, seeing cable growing. So that, that's first of all the, the understanding and thinking looking at the whole game. So that's number one. Number two, there is a slight difference in terms of the margin from retail to wholesale, but due to the contingent model, it's not a big anymore. As you know, from, from the ULL pricing to the contingent uh, model pricing, there's mm -hmm. uplift in there. So there is a difference. It's not so big anymore. And uh, I think, uh, again, the, the perspective is fight cable, not, not wholesale. Here. Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, Thomas. And I think we move on to Polo Tang from UBS. Polo, your question, please. Um, yeah, hi. I um, just have a few different questions. Uh, just on German mobile, um, you've had very strong postpaid net ads 
uh, in Germany for the past seven, eight quarters. So my question is, is when is this going to feed through into improving mobile service revenue growth? And related to German mobile, uh, can you just talk through uh, LTE in Germany? So what are you seeing in terms of the uplift to data usage and the, the uplift to ARPU? And just finally, um, if something does happen with T-Mobile US, can you just talk us through future uses of cash? Could we expect this to be returned back to shareholders, or would it be a case of reinvesting uh, proceeds to, to strengthen your European footprint? Thanks. So first of all, I think on the German mobile side, we are uh, very positive about the development because we see absolute revenue growth on service revenues, not having seen that too often during the course of the last years, to be honest. Um, the, um, and I think that the main reason for seeing that positive trend versus market, um, as I mentioned, we, we still expect the market to decline around two, maybe 3% uh, vicinity, um, is about the, the, the differentiation in the network. So um, our view is uh, what we've seen in the, the net ads, what we've seen, by the way, also in the way we differentiate um, in the marketplace um, in terms of uh, network quality um, also is already reflected in our um, performance on the service revenues, and, and we expect that uh, to, to go on further. Look, another famous idiom for me here. Um, you have to, um, uh, to kill the bear first before you tailor uh, the skin. Uh, so therefore, um, Bolo, your, your question with regard to um, the use of cash of a potential sale of the U.S. business. Um, this is something, you know, uh, which, is, which is totally theoretically and, uh, and nothing, uh, you know, which, which we really could seriously discuss. But um, maybe um, let me share a little bit of my thinking. Um, at the AT&T times, you know, um, uh, we were very balanced in the approach towards um, debt holders, equity holders, um, and uh, towards our balance sheet uh, here. And um, this should always lead us uh, on, on, on this kind of considerations. Um, I'm a big shareholder of Deutsche Telekom, and therefore I'm, I'm even, you know, um, uh, interested to see the appreciation uh, uh, from this kind of potential deals. And just to follow up on uh, the question about LTE, uh, what kind of uplift are you seeing in terms of data usage in ARPU? Uh, the, the uplift in LTE is, is linked, or let's say the other way around. Uh, the most um, um, supporting element of LTE is um, the, uh, to drive the MRCs upwards. So the MRCs being sold to make sure that th those MRCs are driven upwards, knowing that there's a lot of noise in the marketplace uh, pushing prices downwards. Um, uh, to give you an even clearer answer on that one, the um, the tariff plan we've sold most is the one where LTE is incorporated, um, even if it is uh, 50 bucks or 45 bucks uh, tariff plan a month compared to 20 to 30 um, euros entry points in the marketplace, the most sold one is the one with LTE. So it's not LTE per se, it's driving up the MRC with the LTE um, element and the LTE uh, service improvement we do have. Thanks. Then, there's no direct uh, measurable uh, up ARPU uh, in Euro, uh, I can uh, recall here on that one. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, okay. Let's move on to Justin Fanel from Credit Suisse. Thank you. Um, the, um, obviously, the, the all IP migration is gaining momentum, uh, and uh, by the looks of your line loss, going very well indeed. I was just wondering um, when you'd be able to start really showing cost cutting benefits. From that is, that, is that a 2015 story, for example? Um, secondly, this this move towards a integrated European platform again, as you go all IP in in Eastern Europe, uh, what are the potential savings there? And again, are they coming through next year, or, or does it take a bit longer? Um, secondly, I just wondering where, how you feel about the potential remedies on the German consolidation deal. Do you, do you see uh, those remedies as something that might actually disrupt? Uh, the market and, and make the market worse, or is it still too early to know? And then finally, do you, do you feel you need to react to Vodafone's recent move to push fixed mobile bundles more aggressively? Do you need to start going quad play in Germany? Thank you. I'm going to start with the um, 
first part of the question of all IP, I think um, it, it's kind of typical for Deutsche Telekom that we are able to create big machines running big volumes in a very appropriate and proper way. So what, what you see right now is in the all IP migration, as mentioned, 45, 50,000 customers being transferred to all IP, changing their CPEs uh, within their home, doing the switching, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, without any relevant or significant impact on service quality and customer reaction and customer feedback. So I think that, that's where we are today. Uh, and I think the good message is that machine is up and running and we will accelerate that number uh, further on. The other part of the story is there are some millions of customers <laughs> to be transferred to make a clean all IP network happen. So that will take some years to make it happen. Talking about two and a half, three million uh, of, of IP migrations this year, you know, it doesn't mean there are still some millions left. So you ask when will we see um, uh, effects of cost cutting in 2015? No, in 2015 not, because 2015 will be somehow the peak of the transformational of the transactional volume, we, we will see, but 2016 onwards, uh, you can expect to see the first uh, savings kicking in here. But on Germany and uh, now on Eastern, Ger uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Justin, very quickly, where are we? We're about, in terms of uh, IP migration, we're at about 70% in Slovakia, end of uh, first quarter, around about 50% in Croatia, 34% in Montenegro, 36% in Hungary. So on average in Europe, uh, including Germany, we're at about 23% uh, with uh, the legacy so far being increased in Romania, but that has always been planned, but we are kicking in uh, later. Uh, with respect to those cost savings there, we always said Macedonia is the first showcase with 10 euros per access line per year to be saved. Um, and we always uh, uh, also promise you that we're coming up with a clear savings uh, number with our capital markets day later the year, because obviously it depends on country by country where the savings coming from. Uh, for example, in Croatia, the biggest chunk of the savings will be from energy, whereas it was completely different in Macedonia. With regard to, maybe I, I like to add one sentence on this um, pan-European um, um, network uh, question here in the integrated European platform. Look, um, this was laid out as a strategy, and I have to be very honest. Um, we have, we are working uh, um, intensively on that uh, subject um, uh, to understand what the opportunities are, where the big cost levers are coming from, what it would mean from a from governance perspective, and other things. Um, and we need some more time to really go through that. So um, it's a strategy; it was laid out, but um, you cannot expect, you know, uh, immediate answers and 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 the benefits coming soon. So we are, we have to work that through um, uh, diligently. Now, uh, my, um, the next question was with regard to the remedies on the German market consolidation. Um, you know that shareholders on both sides approved the deal um, and um, EU regulatory approval process is still ongoing. Um, I think O2 made uh, a remedy proposal to the EU Commission and all market participants received this proposal and had the opportunity to, to comment upon. Um, the EU Commission will decide on that paper at the 23rd of June, at least that is our knowledge here at Deutsche Telekom. And it is very difficult to discuss now uh, the remedy proposal here because we are all lying under an NDA uh, uh, in this regard. All I can say um, um, from our painful experience um, um, and one of my biggest management mistakes I personally did was the tailoring acquisition in Austria eight years ago. Um, Intramarket consultation in general, in general, has to be possible in Europe. We need that uh, in order to set the economic framework for the necessary infrastructure investments um, into the mobile infrastructure and um, scale matters in our industries. I think that is clear to everybody. But the remedies imposed um, on any deal should not kill the economic logic and the synergies of such a deal. Otherwise, it would be better to walk away from such a deal. And um, we should uh, done that um, uh, in Austria uh, in the past, um, um, but um, we were so much committed at managers to, to, to get things executed. And I hope that the Telefonica management is um, seriously con considering the price and the benefits um, uh, of this kind of, uh, of remedies. And, and therefore, um, let's wait what is coming out of their um, um, proposal at the 23rd of June. Going to Germany, react to push bundles more aggressively. Uh, quad play, yes. 
uh, and um, this comes from my heart. We were the first company here in Germany uh, bringing the fixed and mobile business together a few years ago. This company is, um, is doing a good job on the sales perspective, it's doing a great job on, uh, on the network differentiation side, it's doing a great job on, on investing into quality. Um, that is the basis of bringing these two networks together. Um, and um, uh, you could be assured that um, independent from the tariffs um, which we have recently launched on, on integrated things. We are we even working on the custom experience side here. So um, I promise you here in that call, during the course of this year, you will see quad play um, and other things around that uh, during the course of 2014. Uh, I would like to add a few words on that one as well, um, because I think it's important to understand how we look at quad play. Quad play in some countries in, in Europe is a discounting game in some countries, it's an upselling game. And we believe, and we have seen the last years already in cross-selling activity, that on quad play there is upselling opportunities and there's uh, opportunities to um, even see a better ARPU with the customer uh, and not um, discounting it because of um, having churn issues. We don't have churn issues here in the marketplace. Fixed line churn is in a proper shape. It's on 65 to 7%. In, in broadband, uh, mobile is in a proper shape. So it's not a defensive game. There's no reason to react on Vodafone or somebody else's activities, bringing fixed line into their shops. Um, it's about creating value on the quad play game. Well, thanks, yeah, thank you. Thomas. And uh, before moving on to Ottavio Adoricio from Sockchain, let me quickly come back to one of the questions from Ulrich beforehand. That was what happened within Vivento. Now, stay tuned, guys. Uh, within Germany, so actually, there was nothing on the outside world changed, but we changed uh, people within THS from group business security into Vivento. Actually, these are the guys at the doors of all our operational businesses throughout Germany. So, uh, Ulrich, you definitely win the question on the most creative question on of, from the backup. Uh, uh, I don't think that anybody will buy our shares on the back of that, but now I think the question is at least tackled. And now let's move over to Ottavio. Hi, good afternoon, gentlemen. A couple of questions on my side. Um, the first is basically related to guidance. Um, Thomas uh, clearly um, um, explained that um, Timus had to uh, soften the guidance for around 100 million uh, to invest in customer growth, but you kept the guidance at the group level. So I was just wondering um, where the savings uh, would come from to compensate for that. And uh, the second, it's basically going back to the U.S. Now, I totally understand and appreciate that it's difficult to comment on what's going on, but without throwing any oil in the fire, um, as Thomas stated, what really the order is, is on one side you've got the DOJ and the FCC that would like to maintain four infrastructure play, uh, players. On your side, uh, you basically said that you do need to basically gain scale, both you and Sprint. Therefore, uh, my question to you is, uh, which sort of remedies and concession um, would be um, uh, prepared to make in the U.S. to facilitate a potential for entrance and therefore to appease any sort of antitrust hurdle that looks to be at the moment on the horizon? Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to start on the question on uh, the compensation. Um, it's quite simple. It's additional cost-saving efforts and activities we agreed upon in the group outside the U.S. to compensate on that one to, to keep the guidance stable. And um, I think that's the simple answer on the first question. Could you just clarify a bit more where? In Germany, in Europe, in the system? Where across those across kind of the problem? whole board. So there's everybody is participating and supporting that one. It's a kind of, you can, you, you can assume a kind of fair share uh, support of everyone in the group in that one. I remember the, uh, the guy. One, one fifth, the guidance revision T-Mobile US in the midpoint is $150. So we're speaking about 100 million euros here. Yeah, and a fair share distribution. Yeah, and a fair share distribution, as Thomas said. Um, Otario, I, 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 th I think, you know, with regard to the U.S., first um, you need a deal. And then, um, um, you know, I, I, I think your question is smart, but um, you could imagine whatever happens, you know, to discuss remedies and concessions in a call, you know, uh, 
that wouldn't make sense at all because this is a bilateral negotiation process then with the authorities and even if we would have a deal on the table i would not disclose that in in, in a court result you would not do that either so therefore i'm sorry for for being that um that straight Understood. Thanks. Thanks, Tim, and thanks, Otavio. And now let's move on to the last question on the call because there's other calls out here uh, in the industry uh, later on. And let's move on to Hannes from JP Morgan. Yeah, good afternoon, and thanks for the question. Um, I just wanted if um, uh, how you're looking at um, incumbent uh, consolidation as a subject. Uh, uh, or priority for you, there was uh, another sort of comment today from um, the German Chancellor, in fact, um, related to uh, the fragmentation of the uh, pan-European industry. Is that a priority? Are you still seeing yourself as, a, as an important player in this? And do you think we will see some relevant action in the next six to 12 months to, uh, to drive sort of pan-European consolidation? Hey, Hannes. Um, so um, the first thing is um, I appreciate that uh, our chancellor is, is uh, fully aware about what's going on here in Europe. We have 28 markets. Um, we, have, we do not have a single market package. The single market package gets reduced to the sour part than, than rather giving some sweet part to our industry. We have a ridiculous discussion on net neutrality. Um, uh, these days, um, looking to the U.S., we could learn in Europe how uh, a market should be uh, structured. Um, and uh, on top of that, we have a competitiveness which is, uh, which is uh, very high. And you know um, all the incentives from uh, regulators are forced on, on, on price re um, regulations than rather on infrastructure investments. So therefore, um, the good thing is that something is changing. And uh, if you read the German press on a daily basis uh, at Frankfurt or on other newspapers, papers, there's a continuous flow of, uh, of a discussion about what Europe needs uh, uh, from, a, from, from a digitalization perspective. Um, um, th therefore, I, I, I appreciate that. But um, look, um, um, it, before you go into consolidation in Europe, um, you need a, another framework. The first one you need a single market package from um, which is supporting um, um, uh, interaction and um, consistent to that one, even the antitrust um, um, perspective has to change. If the antitrust perspective is only related to, um, uh, to, the, to the local countries, um, then even the single market will never take place. So therefore, I think these are the two prerequisites um, before uh, a, a really a consolidation uh, should take place. You know I'm a, I'm a fan of, of, of European consolidation. Um, uh, at one point in time, it has to uh, take place because scale matters in our industry and the synergies could be realized. But at that point, it would be uh, much earlier to speculate on this kind of um, uh, Europe-wide uh, and cross-country uh, regulation because the framework isn't given um, at that point in time. So um, in the next months, to drive something and to see something, I would say no. Excellent. Thank you. Tim, Hannes, thank you very much. Um, we're ending the call right now. I, th I know that there is a couple of more people in, in, in the waiting chain. We obviously will call all of you from the IR team in the next 20 to 25 minutes. So thanks for that. Uh, and for the rest, especially on the buy side, I think we see uh, many of you in the next weeks so will on the road uh, on conferences and uh, in London in other areas, Boston and New York with Tim and Thomas. More than happy to see and discuss the trends with you personally. Thank you very much and have a good day. Bye-bye. We'd like to thank you for participating at this conference. The recording of this conference will be available for the next seven days by dialing plus four nine one eight zero five. 2043089 via reference number 446755 hash. We are looking forward to hear from you again. Goodbye.